very much to the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting workshop. So in this talk, um, two things are a bit different as compared to many talks here. So first of all, the dimension of the field series I consider is good old fashioned tool and exclusively tool. Um, and um, the second thing is that uh, we're not considering equations of motions, topological terms, but we actually work with solutions of equations, namely the equations defining conformal laws. So since uh, probably most of you have heard the word conform logarithmic conformal field theory, but this is maybe some time ago for many of you, let me start with some formula from the standard random string theory textbook. So if you have a chiral primary field in a two-dimensional uh, CFT, in a two-dimensional chiral CFT, then um, uh, you know that uh, you have certain equations for the zero zero or zero mode, uh, uh, for the zero zero mode, for example, for the zero mode, this one. And um, this leads to equations which you've definitely seen many times. Then um, if you combine it with the invariance of the uh, vacuum on the, uh, on the Riemann sphere, then you get a set of differential equations and one of the exercises you're supposed to do in the course, or which the lecturer is supposed to do for you, is that the general solutions for <coughs> this, the general solution for the point conformal block, um, is uh, on the sphere has scaling behavior. This is very bad. Now we are modifying the game ad hoc by saying, okay, let's assume that L0 doesn't act diagonally, but that L0 has some non trivial solution. <coughs> this was the beginning of logarithmic CFT. So remember, <coughs> this means that L0 doesn't act by a semi-simple endomorphism. So then the OPE is modified. And um, by very standard calculations, you know how the zero or zero mode acts. Then using, a, uh, what you should keep in mind here, by the way, it's, um, this is the diagonal term, and there is a logarithmic partner, as it's called, but that's simply because I'm writing down things here for a two by two drawn and block. Well, and then from these equations for the Verasso or zero modes, you get differential equations, and I didn't care to write them down, all of them, because they are three more lines, which are terribly instructive, and you wouldn't like to solve as an exercise as a student in a CFT class what's the most general solution, but um, I solved it here for you under some simplifying assumption, namely that these two fields corresponding to the field and its logarithmic partner are mutually bosonic. And then you see that the two-point blocks have, uh, for the field itself, they have an additional term which is logarithmic in the name, the name logarithmic CFTs. So these are conformal blocks. In a sense, these are building blocks for correlators, so we, we're not talking about actions. We have already building blocks for the correlators. And uh, once you find these building blocks for correlators, you might get into despair and say, OK, there's no chance to build locally correlated functions for this because they're logarithms around. Actually, the situation is not so bad because already in the mid-90s, there was one example known for the C is equal to minus 2 model where people by hand found um, some local correlation functions on the sphere. But how do you know that you can do it for arbitrary genus even over one? Well, that's what I want to talk about. And we will encounter then for the solution structures which can have a right to be called, um, uh, to appear in a higher structure conference. Okay, <coughs> so first of all, let me make a side remark. Um, um, it's a word that hasn't been used a lot in, in this conference, and I'm not going to use a lot of them examples. There's a lot of progress um, in logarithmic CFTs constructing examples. And it uses mainly uh, screening charge technology. Screening charges turn out to have a particularly nice algebraic structure. And for example, in this work by Semikatov, Lentner, Feigin, and uh, the group around them, they found it has a Lie algebraic structure. It forms a Nichols algebra that's nothing but the positive Borel of the quantum group. So you get here plenty of very interesting vertex algebras and categories of conformal blocks where you have a hope to control them in the theoretic terms. And um, now what I want to do here is I want to construct from these conformal blocks 
the local C and T by combining left movers and right movers. And this is related to something you could call real physics. These are theories that appear in the description of critical dense polymers. Um, <coughs> related theories that appear uh, for critical population, actually the results I'm going to present are not sophisticated enough to cover critical population. And the question mark on the screen is a real question mark. There are papers claiming that there are applications that I don't understand. So what do we do? We have the conformal blocks where we solve the chiral water identities. They will form um, a vector bundle over the modular space of curves of genus G with n marked disks. Um, that single out is sub-bundle here with a trivial bundle by the chiral water identities. And this bundle comes famously with a projectively flat connection, a logical <coughs> connection. You can look at its local sections, but they are multivalued. They cannot be correlators uh, in general, but you would like to select specific correlators there. Now, this system is obviously way too difficult to control it in any way to say there's a set consistent choice of correlators, but there's a very nice thing because monotromy of these <coughs> vector bundles with projectively flat connection, and let me drop the word projectively for the rest of the talk, but trust me, it has been taken into account. Um, well, the monotromies uh, give a representation of the fundamental proof of this moduli space, which is the mapping class. <coughs> so, if you want to have the existence of global sections and you want to describe them, it's enough to keep track of these representations of mapping class groups. And there is a very well developed machinery to keep track of these things. That's a modular functor. It can be uh, developed for categories which are based, uh, which come from this source, which are non semi simple. And that's a tool to keep track of these representations. OK. So we work at a categorical level for more than technical reasons, but um, uh, we impose fundamental conditions. So in particular, this will ensure that the, construct, um, the objects I will need in the construction, like, for example, certain co-ends, they exist. And I'm not going to discuss their existence here. And, um, Still, uh, what I would try to advertise is that some of the results we get are structurally formulated in such a way that they might uh, reappear in more general contexts, like, for example, um, theories that are not finite anymore, like uh, theory theory. Okay, so this is the plan for this talk. Um, actually, I will start to explain to you a little bit what this modular functor is by introducing what's called the Lego type builder game. Lego is this game. That's because we will build up things from simple building blocks. And um, we will build this up for, and please keep this in mind, we want to combine left movers and right movers. So we take the chiral data, which are described by the Bradic monoid in category C for the left movers, for the right movers, because we have different chiralities. We take C with the opposite braiding. Now, something very important happens. Uh, you know that um, typically in the categories, in the semi simple case, the modular matrix S is non degenerate. The modular matrix S is something we cannot work with in the non semi simple case because it's defined by looking at isomorphism classes of symbols. But there is a nice generalization, and that's some of the progress in, uh, in the field that. Um, in the non semi simple case, um, modular amounts to saying that this specific expression is a twin felt center. It's the twin felt center of C. I'm going to explain this a little bit more later on. So, we're going to make a Lego Teichbüller game for a certain twin felt center. Then I will explain to you what a consistent <coughs> set of correlators is, and you will see expressions that are quite similar, formally, to the diagrams we have seen in Samuel Monnier's talk. And uh, then I will show you that we can solve this. And it, um, the solutions to this are in a very nice algebra uh, in correspondence, one-to-one to one correspondence to a very nice algebraic structure to something I will define, which is called modular Frobenius algebra. 
and then towards the rest of the uh, end of the talk, I will explain that this, um, <coughs> these statements um, extend also to boundary fields. We yeah, start to understand more about boundary fields, and um, then I will um, review also some more recently. <coughs> okay, so let's start with this Lego Teichbüller game. So, um, this is all free mathematically rigorous, and you need to install a certain amount of um, terminology. So we are interested in Riemann surfaces. Well, this is a Riemann surface of genus uh, one, with a certain number of marked points, or rather, with a certain number of um, disks cut out. Now, um, uh, the idea is Lego. You need simple pieces from which you can build everything. We take a pair of pens decomposition, and we can take it in such a way that we have decomposed by these red circles everything in boundary, uh, in components which are n punctual sphere with n smaller than this. That's uh, not true for the picture I've drawn here, uh, because here's one, two, three, four, so you would have to decompose even more. Then you have to rigidify the situation a little bit. So as auxiliary data, you choose a point for each pair of pens. You uh, link in a non-intersective way each boundary circle by some lines, and you say, what is your first line? OK, this is what is called an um, extended surface. Now to turn this into a category, you need to add morphisms. <coughs> and um, Sorry, this is a marked surface. Yeah. So um, <coughs> now, an extended surface is less. An extended surface is a smooth oriented surface where I don't have such a graph, I have in and out going boundaries, and to rigidify a little bit the situation at the boundary, because we have eight twists around, um, we um, fix a point on the boundary. The morphisms we add to the extended surfaces are the actions of magnetic class groups. After all, that's the fundamental group of the um, moduli space on which we want to work. And we add, moreover, sewing. So there is a morphism which relates surfaces of different genus, which is non-invertible, which um, means that I'm gluing together two boundary circles of two, uh, um, a surface, a surface which is not necessarily connected, by the way, in such a way that the mark points. OK, now these. Um, surfaces, these um, marked surfaces, they should become a category as well. And what do you do? Well, you have these additional graphs on the surfaces, and what you are adding are moves for graphs. And the moves have been discussed in various things, uh, contexts, so um, moves, which cause sequences of moves to be more precise, <coughs> and I'm not going to present all of them to you. So for example, um, we have marked, oh sorry, I'm confused by the direction of these arrows here. Um, yeah, so, but this arrow here, this is one which has a direction, and obviously um, here, which, uh, which one is marked to be considered the first insertion, that doesn't matter. I need a move which moves around this and implements cyclic invariants. Then I need a move which implements abrading. I need a move which implements fusing. I need a move which implements um, associativity. So associativity means that I'm changing the pair of pants composition. Here I have a trillion, here I have a trillion, two a trillion here, and a trillion here. And there is finally some genus one, uh, one move which exchanges the two non contractable sizes. So this is a mathematical formalization of things that are known since Mosaic's work. And Importantly, there are 13 different relations, and it's late, it's the last afternoon of a long week, so I'm not going to discuss the relations. Um, what you can show is that this groupoid of fine markings is a very trivial one, so if you do more of the relations, then um, you find that any two markings can be connected by a sequence of moves, and that this sequence of moves is unique, it's unique up to relations. And of course, you can forget the marking, and then you can show that these two groupoids are actually equivalent. Namely, it's easier to show how to get from the action of a mapping class group um, 
uh, some sequence of markings. You take a marked sequence, you act with the mapping class group on it, it has a different marking, and then you use a sequence to go back to the old marking. So the, this is the, the, the unmarking part. So now we have to look a little bit into these categories. And these categories have a very rich and natural structure. There is a co-end. There is a co-end of which you can uh, um, profitably think about the right generalization of the co-adjoint action. Yeah, so if you take the co-adjoint representation in a representation category, um, it can be written as such a co-end. And uh, it is known for a long, long time that this co-end, if the category is a finite uh, written category, has a lot of algebraic structure. It is a Hopf algebra. And it is not only a Hopf algebra, but a Hopf algebra <coughs> with a Hopf pairing. What is a Hopf pairing? Well, a Hopf algebra is by definition self dual. Uh, it has a product and a co product, and we have the Hopf pairing is changes the product to the co product and vice versa. Okay, so uh, inside our um, category of chiral data, we have this distinguished object. If you use two rational CFTs, this would be simply take the sum over all uh, simple representations SI and SI2. This is an expression which appears over and over. Now, there is a definition of uh, what this Hopf pairing is. This Hopf pairing is defined in terms of a monotromy. Um, namely, you can ask that this Hopf pairing is non degenerate. That's one of the things we are trying to do. Have a bilinear form, ask it to be non degenerate and see what structure we have. It turns out, and this is important progress uh, just two years ago, that the non degeneracy of the Hopf pairing is equivalent to the following thing is equivalent to our category is graded. So a drink felt center is a category plus half, uh, but objects here are objects in C plus a half graded, so there's definitely a nice factor. But you can also say I take an object here and the opposite half braiding because there are two half braidings. So there's also a functor here and these two functors combine into a single functor from the delinear product into the Greenfield center. That's a braided functor and the statement that this is uh, braided equivalence is um, equivalent to saying that uh, the category is modular. So modularity means that we are implicitly working when combining left movers and right movers with three kind centers. Okay. Now, in this specific context, many things simplify. So we have so-called finite tensor categories. Finite categories are equivalent to finite dimensional representations over a finite dimensional algebra. And uh, so this is type of finiteness conditions. And if you compute now co-ends in categories of left exact functors, then it turns out that um, uh, co-end in left exact functors is representable and it's representable precisely by this object. Okay. Now let's set up our Lego Teichmann again. So what do I want to do? I want to take the surface with, marked bound, with, with boundaries, ingoing or outgoing, but I don't care so much about ingoing and outgoing because I have a duality which allows me to turn ingoing into outgoing, and to produce for this situation something which assigns for a given set of labels, vector spaces, which does so in a factorial way, and which does it in a way uh, that this is left exact. Well, the reason is that the category of left exact tensors uh, functors behaves nicely. There's a delinear product for them, while if you take arbitrary categories, there's no nice delinear product between them, arbitrary functors. <coughs> okay, so now you cannot do much on spheres. On spheres, you should take invariance, and you should use the tensor product. So um, here the functor is simply take the tensor product and then take invariance for the three functor sphere. And here you need to say which one do I select as U1 to 
to have uh, things fixed, not only up to isomorphism, <coughs> and that's the role of this first arrow I fixed. Okay, now um, I'm sewing together by taking co uh, ends in categories of left exact functors. The fact that sewing together doesn't depend on the order in which I'm sewing, that's the famous Kubini theorem for co ends that helps here. And in the end, since all these um, co-ends are representable, you can represent a conformal block for um, a surface at genus G by looking at a home space with this specific co-adjoint object with this specific co-end inserted to the power G, the G is the genus. And these spaces come with very explicit representation of the matrix class group, which are absolutely explicitly known and which can be computed. Okay. So now we have done something for um, <coughs> marked surfaces. We've associated a functor. We have used the marking. There was an unmarking, and we want to get a functor here. And you do a count extension. You do a right count extension. Now you are. You should be afraid that um, doing a right count extension and trying to get a, a, a monoidal structure is a bit dangerous. But you shouldn't forget that these um, things here are almost groupings. That's a few only vertical models. And so talking about a Khan extension is a very good word. But I do it to save simply notation and make it appear more conceptual. So it's not a very serious Khan extension. OK, so this exists, and it has a very natural monoid structure. So we've set up a nice description of our conformal blocks. So now let's try to describe in this framework what bulk fields are. What are bulk and bulk correlators? Okay, you'd like to have um, an object which describes your space of bulk fields. It decomposes into representations of left movers and right movers. And in the semi-simple case, you would like to, you would make an answer with certain multiplicities here and the multiplicities are non-negative integers, and they should be in such a way that the whole expression is modular invariant. Well, now, since we are not simply simple, such an answer doesn't make any sense. Why should I do it in symbols? Why should I do it in projectors? So, um, we take just any <coughs> object, and we will investigate what type of conditions we get from this object. Okay. So, we fix now this object F on which we want to derive conditions, and um, we consider the corresponding conformal blocks. So for a given uh, object F, for the moment it's just an object, we um, take the marked surfaces. At any insertion of the marked surface, um, we put the object F, <coughs> then the factors I had previously constructed give me a vector space. But well, actually a vector space plus a representation of the metal class group. And um, so we define all objects we consider the previously constructed uh, block of four marked uh, surfaces, and we get here an object. Uh, we get here uh, a vector space. And I should remind you that sewing was implemented in terms of a co-end. So sewing morphisms are very explicit. They are just structure morphisms of the co-end. Okay. Now, uh, you need to sit down and calculate it. I'm not going to do this for you here. Namely, you have to check that this assignment of morphisms respects all the 13 relations I've presented. This means that somehow the relations for structural morphisms in uh, braided monoidal categories, actually written categories, are nice enough to be compatible with this geometric structure. That's the standard type of metric that has to work. Well, this can be done. And then we want to use our unmarking surface to get a factor that doesn't depend anymore on the marking. So now you have for any surface um, 
I mean, any trainers, any number of insertions, we have a vector space which comes with some representation of the modular group, uh, sorry, the mapping class group. What we want to find is conditions on F which ensure that in the end we find invariance in these vector spaces, invariance under the action of the mapping class group, because the mapping class group is a fundamental group. Invariance means that correlation functions don't have monotron, they have simple value functions. Okay, now um, let me describe what we really want to find. So, what we want to find is um, the following thing. We have this category of surfaces with boundaries of any genus and morphisms which are mapping class groups or assuming together. Then we have this functor block uh, which for a given object f gives us a vector space. There's also a trivial functor which assigns to any surface the one dimensional vector space C <coughs> and to any morphism the identity on C. This is what we've seen in Monier's talk at the beginning of the week, this type of structure. And a correlator should be a natural transformation between these objects. So why does it make sense? Well, it makes sense because the natural transformation comes with a complete sphere. So to a surface, this functor assigns the ground field and the ground field and the identity. Here to this, it assigns uh, the vector spaces of conformal blocks. The morphism from K to here is nothing but a vector. And here, this is the action of a mapping class group element or assuming, and this means that things are compatible with the action of the mapping class group or assuming. And there should be one normalization condition, uh, or not even normalization condition, we want to be um, uh, the correlator for the sphere with one ingoing factoring or outgoing factoring. So just to avoid, otherwise uh, we could, for example, select zero would, would be one solution, not very welcome solution. Okay, so what we do is we first construct pre-correlators. So we construct a natural transformation for marked surfaces, and then we use the universal property of the Carl extension, because if we have now here um, a, a natural transformation in uh, this triangle, then by the universal property of the Kahn extension, we get um, natural transformation, which is a <coughs> set of correlators. <laughs> okay, so we do this, and uh, now we have to put it in a little bit more structure. And everybody who had a course on CFT has a suspicion of what to take. You would like to insert somehow the three point functions on the sphere and would like now, to insert two point functions on the sphere in going outgoing, non trivial non pair. And let's also keep here the one point function of the sphere. In the semi simple case, this is just the vacuum, but now we have to be a bit more careful on how to project in a, in a non semi simple set. Okay, good. So now I take these three morphisms. Let's look at them again. Uh, so this is a morphism from f to the zero, which is the monoidal unit to f to the fq. This is a morphism from f to the monoidal unit. This is an endomorphism of f. And we re we <coughs> remassage them. We remassage them in such a way that we get a morphism from f to f tensor f. We get a morphism from f tensor f to f, and we get a morphism from one. To and if we have this, it's very easy because we have everything sewed together, everything from three punctured sphere to two punctured sphere to uh, build up a candidate for this natural transformation and to check consistency. And the answer is uh, this is consistent precisely if F with this multiplication morphism, this co multiplication morphism, and this as a unit and an object, a uh, morphism I'm not going to give explicitly here, eta f, because it's fixed anyhow, is a co commutative symmetric Frobenius algebra, then it's consistent at genus one, <coughs> and it is consistent at all genera, at any genus, if it is a modular Frobenius algebra. What is a modular Frobenius algebra? This is a notion we coined, so you cannot 
possibly not, unless you've read our paper, which has lots of sites. Um, okay, so a mod let's consider the following one point um, situation. So we take here a graph where we take our Frobenius algebra f, we do a co-product, and then we do a product, and then um, there is actually a unique way no, sorry, don't do the product. So I take f. I take the co-product of f. I go into f tensor f. Now, I have a morphism which allows me to relate f to f pure. This is something we have in any Frobenius algebra. <coughs> and then the co-n comes with morphisms from, for any object, so quite particular for f, from f tensor f into the co -end k. This is what I have here. And I require that this morphism is the same as the morphism from F to K as going here into K. But K was a Hopf algebra. So K comes with its own antipode, which I call SK. <coughs> Putting SK on it doesn't change the morphism. That's the definition of modular. Well, Maybe instead of proving this, let me make some comments. Okay. Yeah. The first thing is um, you can evaluate this condition very explicitly in the semi-simple case. And then you will find that this condition forces the category we are working in to be in critical center. We conjecture that this holds true, also in the non-semi-simple case, but simply for lack of time, it's not yet true. So the fact that combining left movers and right movers in this new, in this correct definition of modularity produces a twin pulse center is directly responsible for getting such uh, a bulk algebra at all. So this is uh, one comment. Of course, this notion of modular deserves more, uh, um, more um, study. Uh, so let's forget about modular for a moment and let me point out that the general structure of the result fits very nicely uh, the microcosm principle. So what is the microcosm principle? The microcosm principle says that if you want to define an algebraic structure, uh, you should do it in a categorical framework which has the same structure among that type. So if you want to define a monoid, let's take a good old monoid, then um, you take a set, and you take the set, and you want to write down a multiplication morphism. But this is only possible since the category of sets is <coughs> monoidal has the Cartesian product as a monoidal structure. Similarly, if you want to define a commutative algebra, you can only do it in a braided monoidal category. Now, um, um, if you want to define a module, you basically need the structure of a module category over a monoidal <coughs> category. It turns out that um, we are working here with monoidal categories with a duality. Monoidal categories with a duality are, by a result of three Frobenius pseudo monoids, uh, pseudo monoids in the bi category <coughs> categories. And um, those of you who know the result of Street know that I'm cheating in a very important way because Street really describes all Frobenius pseudomonoids and they are more than categories with dualities. They are star autonomous categories. And one intriguing thing is that um, some categories in logarithmic CFTs are by nature rather star monoidal than monoidal with the dualities. So we have very good indications that the category relevant for critical population doesn't have a duality, but is only star autonomous. So this very nicely fits with this. But of course, the whole TFT formalism has been developed by people believing very much in dualities because they want to kind of rhythms which bend around. So somehow there's a lot to be done in the world of TFTs. Um, <coughs> now, you can want to do such um, modular Frobenius algebras exist at all? And the answer is there's a rich source of existence. So let's suppose to simplify matters here, not to introduce too much, that our category has been 
obtained from a factorized Rippenkopf algebra. So it's a way to represent the category. Then, if you fix a Rippenkopf automorphism, then the following cohen is always a factorizable, that is always a modular Frobenius algebra. So you see this old thing that you can combine left movers and right movers by summing over all um, simple modules is replaced by take all modules and do a co end. And that's a module. And um, of course, you can take here omega to be the identity. That's what people in CFT in the rational case would call the Cardi case. The very nice thing is that you can write down very explicitly the morphisms that describe correlators. I'm not saying that we can describe correlators because computing them as functions would mean that we have to compute to understand a system of uh, conformal blocks on a moduli space for curves of genus whatever. And this is clearly not contained in this technology and maybe hopeless at all. But the correlators, their existence is guaranteed and they can be written down in a very natural way in terms of the Frobenius structure and um, in terms of a natural co-module structure of the Frobenius algebra over this Hopf algebra. Okay, so this is the progress about bulk fields. Of course, classifying all consistent bulk fields and given a concrete category is a very hard problem. So this is, I'm not claiming that if you give me a concrete category, I have efficient tools to compute all these um, modular Frobenius algebra. That's but we know what structure corresponds to, and it's very nicely in accordance to situations which are maybe not higher category, but we have at least two categorical uh, structures in two categorical dimensions next to each other. Okay. Now, uh, well, sorry. Let me first make a comment on the Cardi case because it's kind of amusing. Uh, let's compute the partition function. Usually, you would say. Uh, to express it in terms of characters, well, there is a nice notion of characters. You can reduce it to Hopf algebra characters, or if you want to be pseudo Hopf algebras, but I'm uh, sparing you all details about Hopf algebra theory here. Uh, then <coughs> the partition function, where uh, the partition function is again expressed as a bilinear combination of characters. <coughs> the simplest situation you get in the semi simple case is that. This is delta ij. This is the charge conjugate moduli invariant you find in CFT groups. In the semi simple case, this is not a moduli invariant. Uh, rather, what appears here is the Cartan <coughs> matrix of the, of the theory. The Cartan matrix of the category is the dimension of the home spaces between the indecomposable projectives. So, of course, if you're semi simple, any project any object is projective, the symbols are projective, and by Schur's lemma, this gives you some delta ij. But in the non semi simple case, non trivial multiplicities appear. It matches a lot of known results <coughs> in the literature. It matches also results about um, sigma, conformal sigma models on supergroups, uh, for example, where this has been obtained by, or where <coughs> some expressions of this type have been obtained. Uh, by doing some harmonic analysis in some approximation. So this is really the Cartan case, the Cartan case in the non semi simple case, the Cartan matrix appears. Okay, so how much time do you have? Um, okay, that's fine. We can go on to boundary states, and um, <coughs> let me give you an impression what you can do. For example, you can ask, if I give you the following three postulates, boundary conditions are objects of a category. In the current case, it should be the category itself. Boundary states should be um, elements in the center of the category, and we know what category is the center. Um, this can be computed as an end by standard formula, and that the bulk state is um, bulk object is given in a form which I have just explained to you. Then, well boundary states should be a decategorification. It's natural to assume that it factors two characters or co-characters because we have algebras and co-algebras in the game. Well, then um, you can prove that these 
these boundary states, which are given by characters, they give by factorization very nice annualization coefficient functions. So these coefficients have to be non-negative integers. It has to be expressible in terms of characters, and that's very non-trivial because if you are non-semi-simple, the space of class functions is not spanned anymore by characters. <coughs> characters span a proper a co-ideal distance. So it turns out to be in this ideal and um, has a non-negative um, expansion and you know, characters. Okay, and last point. Um, I was explaining that I'm using that exact functors. So you cannot have, so whenever I construct a modular functor, I do it in terms of home spaces and the home functor famously is left exact. If you have a left exact functor, you should feel tempted to derive it. So, uh, derive it, and we can show the following thing. And of course, as the derived functor, you get x, and you will find that the mapping class group naturally acts on <coughs> all these x spaces. And in particular, the modular group acts on the corresponding x, um, x space for the torus, which is nothing but Hochschild uh, cohomology, and um, actually it acts even on the Hochschild complex of every factorizable written Now this modular group action in the semi-simple case by the famous Berlinde formula knows K0 as a ring. The Berlinde formula is not known to hold in any version for uh, the non-semi-simple case, but here we have a whole bunch of representations of the modular group, so it's a question what these representations know about the category. What are higher generalizations of the Linde formula? And um, the whole thing is a rather subtle interplay of the monoidal structure, word of monoidal categories with homological algebra. And I should very briefly point out, <coughs> maybe not how it's proven, it's, uh, it's, um, it uses very non-trivial things about mapping class groups. Um, I should point out that um, that we really find on the Hochschild complex in higher degrees genuinely new representations of the uh, modular group in the sense that you cannot find that these representations are very different from what you find in degree zero. So there's new information hidden. We don't have any idea what this means. So this is um, this is um, these are results. Uh, well, essentially, it's accumulating evidence, maybe not even building up a theory for the moment. And of course, it raises a couple of questions, and we've been asked to present questions. So um, uh, let me uh, <coughs> go a little bit back to the talk. Uh, of course, you would like to, to uh, find to describe also correlators of boundary fields and defect fields. Uh, this will take time but it's not impossible. A more ambitious uh, project is to uh, deconstruct these corridors by some holographic construction using a three-dimensional TFT. Now, in the semi-simple case, a camel T, the three-dimensional TFT, that's known from the structure of the extended cobordism uh, category, um, the cobordism by category. But um, there can be something people call a 2 plus epsilon dimensional T of T, meaning that it's not defined on all three manifolds. So this is this usual problem that uh, in the top dimensions this theory might not be completely defined. Well, what are the conceptual questions that are around? Of course, how stable are these results conceptually? Can we formulate the <coughs> numerous algebras in more general contexts? And then uh, get bulk, out, uh, bulk fields in the same way. Uh, how important is the duality in the sense of dual uh, objects? And finally, uh, concerning these derived modular functor, well, we have not only conformal box, we have their derived versions. They are simply around. They are around as soon as I'm not looking at the semi simple pattern. As far as I know, Nobody in CFT has ever used these gadgets, although they are around. Yeah? So, 
it's quite unlikely that something which is so nat in a natural way mathematically around and which is so natural that it has representations of the mapping class group, meaning representations of the corresponding complexes, um, that this doesn't have any use in CFT. So what is the correct construction of the derived CFT where these derived conformal blocks have any word to say? And maybe even in retrospect, we have to understand why could we construct a modular functor, or why could already 20 years ago, Zubachenko construct a modular functor just using the homes, although the x are naturally there. So I'm not promising that for the next meeting we have any notion of a derived conformal field theory. I don't have any physical inspiration for this, so we should ever come across a derived version of conformal blocks, please. Thank you. Thank you. Any good questions? So is this uh, notion of derived the same sense as the other speakers used? Or is it? Well, I used it in a very naive way. I had functors which I left exact. I'm deriving the functors. Okay. Of course, I'm deriving <laughs> them in a standard way. Yeah. Um, I could now tell you that um, I'm using a model structure on the category of complexes, but of course I'm using the projective model okay. structure and then it's good old fashioned. Uh, uh, derived functors of the left is a functor. Yeah. But probably to understand a little bit better what sh should be in this set in a reasonable way to describe our spaces. Yeah. Then you won't get a, a long with um, homological algebras of 50s and 60s. Okay. Because that's what we were using. <laughs> we look forward to new uh, developments in that direction. Let's thank Christoph again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.